the challenge is still facing us. Uh, we've talked about it today, uh, the national uncertainty and policy making. Um, and I, I think some of that is uh, starting to uh, shape up. Uh, weak consumer confidence, uh, job growth, uh, financing. Uh, financing has been very difficult uh, for our tenants and, and uh, uh, this, this last year we've done a lot of non-traditional uh, leasing and also a lot of local leasing while all the, the national retailers have been fairly quiet. Uh, and it's taken us a lot longer to execute uh, leases and a lot of that is because our tenants, even though they have strong track records and they may be relocating from a Class B location to one of our locations, they still have very difficult to, to uh, find money to build out their space. So, the, so they're coming back to us and asking us for uh, additional tenant uh, finished dollars. So either we fund those out of pocket or, or we uh, present another plan to the bank. Um, and uh, the other thing we're seeing is the empowerment of opportunistic tenants. Um, and that's been going on for the last couple of years, and I hope there's not too many tenants in here, but um, they've been waterboarding us for a couple of years. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but they've, they, they, uh, those deals have been cut in the last two years. We see those dissipating next year. And uh, at some point, there's gonna be a tipping point. Uh, like I said before, we've had um, uh, all your, your publicly traded retailers uh, have been uh, getting their houses in order and they're starting to grow and they're starting to sh show a profit and uh, and that's all been internally generated so uh, you know at a two percent so to increase their sales more they're going to have to grow with new stores so we really feel that uh, there's going to be a tipping point where they're going to have to go and and start opening up new stores and uh, we see that coming up and uh, that's what's ahead and that's our exit sign recovery <laughs> Uh, this is a very interesting chart for some of you guys that are in the retail business. These are future anchor developments that we know about uh, that are happening today and beyond. Uh, and of course, grocery stores are, are the top of the food chain. It's, uh, it's daily needs and uh, people always need to eat. And so th these are what hold tremendous value in, in retail. <clears throat> anyway, here you see the market leaders, uh, Walmart number one with 28% of the market. Uh, Kroger at 25.5%, then you see HEB at 14%, Randall's, and then Fiesta. But on the map, uh, you can see uh, a lot of red. And uh, so we feel there's going to be a shift in market shares where HEB uh, is going to take away from Walmart and Kroger. Uh, they also have a Joe V's concept, which is a square with a green in it. Uh, Joe V's, for any of you that don't know, it's their warehouse concept. Um, that uh, caters to a lower demographic uh, markets and, uh, and low price points. So HEB's got a, quite a few um, uh, different products that they can, um, they can introduce to the market from the central market to your core stores uh, to, uh, to uh, Joe V. So they've, they've done a great job of penetrating this market. And also you can see here also in, in, inside the loop you've got um, three Walmarts, uh, uh, the uh, Walmart Northline, I believe just recently opened, and they're under, under construction <clears throat> at the Silver location in I-10. And then um, the uh, Hyde store was just announced, and that should be opened in 2013. So our outlook for, for next year, we see an increase in the number of tenants looking for, for locations. Uh, we'll see a lot more uh, tenants coming to the market on site rides and identifying locations. We'll also see a continued pressure from uh, on the public retailers to grow externally, like we just discussed, through new store expansion. Uh, and this next uh, bullet point is pretty important. It's where are these people going to find where are these tenants like uh, are going to find these uh, locations, and they're going to find them in these legacy assets. And and legacy assets are assets that uh, started development uh, prior to the downturn. And let's say a developer went out and bought 60 acres. And uh, they developed 30 acres and put in a, a couple of anchors and maybe some inline space and some, some pad sites. And then they had additional la uh, land that was phased for, for future development. And, and when the market stopped, uh, the land is just sitting there. There's a, there's a number of those in the market. I, last night I counted them, got on the website, started printing out site plans. I go, oh my God, there's a lot of these out there. Uh, there's over 20 of them. Uh, but they're all anchored. And so, 
the reason why the, when the market picks up and these uh, junior anchors are looking for new stores, uh, they're going to go to these, these legacy assets uh, because the land's already been purchased, the financing's in place, the entitlement and utilities are there. And, and the, real important, they, the anchor is there and there's proven sales and they've proven up the market. So you, it, once the tenants realize that uh, there's certain things they can't do anymore, like some, certain co-tenancy clauses, and they'll have to pay rent that justifies building for them, uh, then I think we'll start seeing some activity probably in the second half of next year to, to the end of uh, next year. And then I think in 2013 looks uh, pretty good. Um, Class A, small retail space, uh, is in tight supply and in, and, and in high demand. We represent a number of small tenant users in the 2,500 square feet to 4,000 foot range, and, and trying to find Class A locations for them is, is fairly difficult. It's a pretty tight market. And, uh, so, and that, again, is a product of uh, just no development over the last couple of years. Uh, we see, again, rental rate increases gradually in the second half of the year. Um, also, uh, we won't see any uh, full price uh, retail centers, uh, ground up developments. Uh, we don't see those for some time. Again, you have the legacy assets you have to work through. And then, um, so for, for land brokers, that's not the greatest thing to hear. Uh, but uh, unless, the, the only exceptions of those would be in urban areas, which where it's hard to, uh, uh, to uh, assemble land. And one example would be uh, the Aimbinder companies. Uh, their uh, development in the Heights, uh, where they sold 16 acres to, uh, to Walmart, and they'll start construction sometime end of next year. Uh, and by the way, that, that uh, sale to Walmart was over $50 a foot for 16 acres, which is pretty incredible in these times that uh, a retailer could pay that kind of money for a piece of dirt. But what I understand is um, when they came back with their volume estimates on sales, that was uh, one of the highest sales volume estimates they had countrywide. So uh, anyway, those urban areas are tough to, to get into, and, and so you may see a little bit of that. Um, also, there might be another outlet center be announced uh, uh, next year somewhere along I-45 South in the Texas City or the Lake City area. It'll be either a Simon Outlet Center or a, a Tanger Mall, and, and I don't think both will get built. It just depends whoever gets there first. Um, and then uh, something that's always been here in Houston is this continued obsolescence of older and poorly positioned retail centers and their candidates for, for adaptive reuses. That, all that means is we need more bingo parlors and churches. <laughs> um, but seriously, you know, our, our, you know, we don't have any um, really uh, 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 zoning, which I'm not a proponent of, and, and we we really build through city ordinances and, and uh, deed restrictions that are placed on the properties. But, um, you know, uh, real estate in Houston changes from block to block and from decade to decade. And <clears throat> retail is uh, so location driven, more so than, let's say, an office building that, that Brandy will talk about next. But you can be in a sub market in, in, in retail, and if you're two blocks off, you, you might be in bad shape. Whereas maybe in an office building, you could be in a submarket, you could be across the street down a little bit, and you're okay. Um, one example of that is uh, the 1960 corridor. That was where, you know, a few decades ago, that's where you wanted to be, was on 1960. And everybody went there and built a lot. And uh, today, there's a tremendous amount of vacancies, and there's some retail centers there that, that I don't think has a shopping environment anymore and, and won't be retail centers and need to be uh, used for something else. And what happened is your demographics changed south of 1960, and then north of 1960, you had higher demographics. And then, then all of a sudden, you have uh, Luetta and Spring Cypress, two more bands of retail that were built on those bands. And so now everybody was trading up to those other retail centers up on 249. So what happened is 1960 was on the, on the bottom end of your market, and now it's changed. So you just have to be real careful when you're investing in, in retail. It's, it's so sensitive to location. And then the last thing, uh, we think like next year, the, the bid-ask uh, uh, gap narrows for distressed properties. We feel that the banks are, are, are going to get pressure to start moving some of the, the, uh, the loans and the REO. And then we also see... Uh, so much capital on the sidelines, I think they'll, they'll start adjusting their uh, return expectations and we'll see uh, some more transaction volume. 
which uh, Bill will enjoy and so will the title companies. So uh, that's all we have today. I think uh, uh, we're cautiously optimistic next year and uh, we look forward to, to seeing some of y'all and uh, working with uh, Boyer Miller. Thank you so much.